Who are some of the biggest sleepers in the 2022 NFL draft? And if you had to predict one player that the Cowboys absolutely will draft later this month, who would that be? All that and more in this episode of the Locked On Cowboys podcast. You are Locked On Cowboys, your Locked daily Dallas Cowboys on. podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Locked Network, your on. team Locked every day. Locked On. Locked On. Locked 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 On Cowboys. Welcome back to the Locked On Cowboys podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We want to thank you for making us your first listen of the day. We are free and available on all platforms. I am Marcus Mosier. You can follow me on Twitter at Marcus underscore Mosier. He is Landon McCool. Check him out at McCoolBCB. Lana, let's get right into the Twitter questions today so we can answer as many as possible. First one, regardless of round, who is one player that you're willing to bet the Cowboys will draft in the 2020, 2022 NFL draft? Man, regardless of round, a player that the Cowboys will draft. Um, you know, I, I, I feel uh, – the, the the plans for the wide receiver and running uh, wide receiver and offensive lineman has been have been well discussed. You know, and I think we yeah. both agree that they're going to try to make moves there one way or another. You know, there has been multiple plans thrown out there. I think that that's that's kind of an unknown, right? Because there's so many names. There's several different offensive linemen. There's several different wide receivers. If I'm picking one, I might actually go with a tight end like Cade Otten. I think mm. because I do think they're going to get one. I don't think that they have as many choices there as they do. Uh, some of the other spots. Um, and I think that there are less avenues. Like, I think that there's an opportunity for them to potentially trade for a wide receiver, trade for an offensive lineman. I think that they won't necessarily go that route for a tight end. They will likely draft a tight end. Uh, and then narrowing down the tight end that they would select to me, I think it's it's down to Ruckert or Kate Ott. And I think one of those two is likely to be picked by the Cowboys if they're available before the third round. So you say third round, K dot. And I like that one. I, I think that's very likely. I'll go with um, Sam Williams, the defensive end from Ole Miss, right? We know yeah. Dan Quinn has a lot of interest. He he went down to Ole Miss's pro day and worked him out. Uh, they have him in for a 30 visit. He hits all the requirements the Cowboys like in that right defensive end, you know, running a sub four, six forty, uh, being able to at least spend a little bit off the edge. Yeah. Plays hard. I think the third round is where you probably could get him. I've seen a couple of mocks that have him in the second round. That feels a little bit rich, little rich. to me. But yeah. 88 feels like a good spot. I, and I think the Cowboys will find a way to draft him. Yeah, I, I think another guy that, you know, very specifically has been uh, researched by the Cowboys a lot, like you mentioned, 30 visit, uh, fills a need, uh, has a high value of production. Mm-hmm. Feels like the kind of guy that the Cowboys think that they would potentially be getting a steal from because he's getting knocked down due to some off-field stuff. So if they've got their hands around that, I wouldn't at all be surprised if uh, if they took him a lot higher than some other teams had him just because they may have superior knowledge there. All right, next question from Chandler. Are you surprised Dallas didn't try to match the Malik Turner deal? If you didn't see the 49ers signed Malik Turner to basically a vet minimum deal on a one-year contract, do you think the Cowboys should have brought him back? I, I mean, I think the Cowboys clearly uh, uh, have plans here. So I, I think that they probably would have liked to have him in their back pocket on the other side of the draft potentially, but I don't know that they were willing to save the roster spot for him if they plan on going and maybe selecting more than one wide receiver in the draft. Who knows? So um, I, I, I wouldn't have been surprised if they re-signed him. But I'm I'm all I'm not all sh- that shocked that he uh, he decided to go to another spot where he thought he may have more opportunities. Uh, yeah, he did have three touchdowns last year. Had some games that he looked pretty decent. Um, yeah, but he's 26 years old. For the most part, you kind of know what you have at that point. Yeah, and I just feel like the Cowboys are pretty comfortable right now with their fourth and fifth receiver. Right, it's Noah Brown, and it's probably Simi Fahoku. They just got to find out who wide receiver three is for the rest of the season. They do have James Washington. They have Michael Gallup who will come back. CeeDee Lamb is going to be your number one. You just need one more guy that you feel comfortable either playing in the slot or the outside. And it's pretty clear they didn't feel like Malik Turner was going to be the answer there. So might as well move on. 
right? Yeah, I mean, clearly, like some vet minimum guy that has bounced around between, like this is, I think, his third or fourth team. He wasn't going to be the guy that you were coming in as, you know, the essentially a starter in your eleven personnel packages, yeah. of, of which you ran more than seventy percent of the time last year. So. I do think that it was unlikely that he was because of what you said and because of the fact that they liked that the down roster guys they have, they didn't really have a spot for him necessarily. So Dallas signed him to do a one year deal uh, worth $750,000 last year in March. Um, and then he got basically double that. And I just don't think the Cowboys were comfortable paying kind of a journeyman receiver double that. And it, it, it feels like pinching pennies and it is a little bit, but these are the type of guys you just, you just don't pay a lot because you can find them. And we don't know what they like. I mean, maybe they like um, some of the down roster guys between Brana Smith, who we talked about last year yep. with Matt Waldman or TJ Vasher, who they still have on the practice squad uh, from Texas tech. So I- I'm fine with this. It wasn't, there's a lot of moves to be upset with Landon. This yeah. isn't one of them. The Cowboys find, find guys like these in their couch cushions every single season. Yep. You know, like whether it's an undrafted free agent or a guy that they sign off the street, right. they, they've been really good at identifying these guys the, as kind of temporary solutions. No need to make them a permanent the, solution. The Lance Lenore types, right? Like yeah. They they find these guys. And there's going to be cool. a million of these guys after the draft, too, that you can find. Um, it's not that big of a deal. Wide receivers uh, don't matter. Oh, oh, you're killing me with that one. Listen, don't, the, don't, don't even give me that look. I know you don't actually believe that. Maybe. <laughs> uh, all right. We got, I want to get to some more questions. But before we do that, let's tell you guys about <laughs> BetOnline. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your betting stats and sports info. Find all the latest sports developments, including league reviews and news, including this year's playoff basketball playoff odds and the start of Major League Baseball season. BetOnline is your continued source for all of your sports wagering needs, including live betting, the playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online where the game starts. All right. Later. This next question from John. He wants to know your 10 commandments of the NFL draft. We're not going to be able to do all 10, but are there a couple rules that you would like to see the Cowboys kind of live by uh, in the draft, of the, not just this year, but over the next several years? You know, I mean, I think I think just the kind of general rules that we talk about all the time, right? Like, uh, you know, paying it to close attention to draft sequencing and and allowing that to kind of help you get the uh, value and, and at the positions that you need at, in the rounds that they're that they're the most valuable. Uh, I think you know, paying special attention to positional value and 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 where contracts are in the NFL and and assigning draft value to those spots because of the idea that you, you want to make sure that you're, uh, you know, pres- saving money here where you, by getting talented players on extremely cheap contracts mm-hmm. for their rookie deals. Um, you know, I, 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 I think give me me the, the athleticism, right? Almost yeah. every big draft hit they've had, they've had over the last two decades has been gambling guys with elite athleticism or elite traits, yeah. right? Tyron Smith coming out of USC, just an incredible athlete, right? Des Bryant still has one of the fastest 10-yard splits we've ever seen at receiver. Micah Parsons, phenomenal athlete. Uh, gamble on the athletes because more often than not, as long as you ha- trust your coaching staff, it's going to pan out. Yeah, I think especially as time has gone on, and especially these last few year- seasons, it feels more and more that uh, athletic upside plays – are not as risky, you know, like, you know, you don't hear that phrase uh, 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 looks like Tarzan plays like Jane as much yeah. as you used to anymore, uh-huh. because, you know, they, they can teach these guys how to play the position if they have the requisite athleticism. Um, it's, and that's not, you know, the, the end all be all at all. Like it's, it's not like you just pick athletes that match uh, uh, the parameters you're looking for. I mean, you, you get into the conversation by being able to play football. Yeah. Like that's, that's, I think the thing that, that gets, kind of lost in this is that it, it, this, uh, uh, you know, emphasis on athleticism and, and testing numbers uh, it, that, that doesn't, you know, the prerequisite to getting into the conversation is that you have to yeah. play football. Well, <laughs> like right. if, if you don't, if the tape doesn't show it, then you're not in the conversation to begin with. So this isn't just like stopwatch watching it's, it's parsing the guys who have already made it into the club. Right. And, and figuring out, oh, okay, these guys are all, have tape that show an NFL football player. 
let's see who the real athletes are of this group. Uh, and then that's kind of what guides you as to who could be, potentially be the most valuable and who could potentially be have the most upside in the future. Yeah, I just, I mean, I think about like Taco Charlton. Somebody had good length, but the athleticism just wasn't there. A very, very a- average athlete. If you look at him in Spark, right? I think he ran like a 501 40 yard dash. I just don't think you can do that, especially high in the draft. Gamble on the athletes. If, they, if they're a little bit raw, that's okay. I'd, I'd rather take the chance on the athletes early on in the draft. Take your non great athletes on day three when just much easier to find, you know, those kind of guys. Um, I, I would also say, the injury guy, the injured guys, man. A good indicator if a guy's going to stay healthy in the NFL is if he stayed healthy in college, right? And the Cowboys love to gamble on injured players. They've done it basically forever. How many of those injured guys ended up really working out for them, right? Like they gambled on Bruce Carter. Would you say the Bruce Carter pick worked out for them? I wouldn't say it didn't work out for them. No, he but gave it, them some it, you never good, got yeah, the it, player that you were hoping to get, right? Maybe, maybe not, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I may push back on that one okay. a little bit. Well, I just think because I, I don't think you're wrong necessarily, but I think the Cowboys have had a little bit better success at times with some of those guys than others. It's just not recently. I mean, you know, like the the the, the Jalen Smith thing. Uh, it worked for probably a season, which was more than most anyone expected, frankly. And so that what about was Morris Claiborne. Claiborne had injuries coming Claiborne into the was... NFL, struggled to stay healthy. Leighton Van Dresch had the neck injury coming into the NFL, and it's really bothered his career. I just okay. So, so I think that's an important distinguish distinguishing thing that you've mentioned here. I think you're 100 percent right. They should not gamble in the first round with those guys because yeah. I think that's too much risk involved. What I do actually like is the Sean Lee, right? Where the first round player who, uh, you know, look, Sean Lee obviously continued to deal with injuries, yeah. injuries throughout his, his career. Would you say that Sean Lee wasn't worth it, though? I would. No, he I was. Would say he this, was. That Sean yeah. Lee was absolutely worth it. So I, I think there is something to the idea of gambling on injured players. But I would say the second round is second round for drafting first round injured players is a lot more palatable than. Yeah. I'm going to take a guy in the first round that has injury problems just because I like him that much. And I think your examples of Claiborne and Leighton Vander Esch really hold out well, where they're guys that you showed you the flashes that you saw on tape in college, but because of injuries, they never developed or they, they just never were the same player after a certain point. So, all right, this leads me to another question that somebody had. They wanted to know about John Mechie, the Alabama receiver, mm. because they, they say, when we talk about day two receivers, we never really bring them up. Yeah, it's true. We, we don't talk yeah. about Mechie a lot. And I saw some people talking on Twitter today like, hey, doesn't Mechie fit the mold of what Will McClay of the Cowboys like, a first-round talented player that might fall to day two because of the injuries? Uh, my problem is I didn't see a first-round player when That's, I watched yeah, this tape. I, I saw exactly. more of a guy that should be picked after the top 50, and then when you factor in his injuries, maybe somebody who's a borderline top 100 pick. I, and I could be wrong. I, I just didn't see – a first round caliber receiver in John Mechie. I agree. And I, I actually think that Mechie is one of these guys who, I don't know, never got the, uh, uh, the marks against him for his injury. Like his stock never fell for the injury. I think he just got placed somewhere in that top of the third, top of the second, uh, you know, through 50, maybe a little bit past 50 picks, right? Like, mm-hmm. I, I don't see a guy, you know, I don't, I agree. I don't see a first round player. I see a kind of mid second round player who, whose injury uh, never, never really, you know, hit his stock. It, yeah. Much. It didn't bump him down a whole round. Like we should, you should yeah. consistently be seeing him in the third round in your mock draft simulators. It's just not the case. Yeah. I, and it might yeah, be because I, of the, the, the wide receiver depth on day two, right? There's just not a lot of good receivers. So he kind of stays in that, 50 to 70 range. Yeah. I, I think that's it, right? Is that he's right at the bottom of the kind of uh, class of wide receivers that I would say that you could draft and hope that they would start right away. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Wide receivers. Uh, but I think, yeah, like whatever uh, injury hit that he, whatever you know stock hit he would have gotten for being, for getting the injury, it seemed to have been washed away by the fact that, that he's the last of that tier and so he likely will be overdrafted uh, by a team that's desperate to make sure that they get out of that round, uh, yeah. realizing that they have no recourse past Mechie. I just, 
I saw a very average player, and I know there's people that are going to be very upset with me, but I saw somebody that I think if he hits the ceiling or it's like a Russell Gage type of player in the NFL, like a fine starting receiver, but nothing that gets you all that excited because he's not overly big. He's not mm-hmm. – he's 188 pounds. He's not super fast, and he drops a ton of passes. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's Second round feels high for me, especially I saw- if you through the ACL. I saw a less athletic uh, Alave, right, and yeah. and and that was pre-injury. Um, I think he I think he runs routes well. He separates pretty well for his size. The concentration drop thing is annoying, um, yeah. but yeah, I, I just see a guy who I don't know that his production would have been nearly as high as it was if he wasn't on a, an offense that had you know, two other incredible wide receivers pulling uh, yep. attention away from him. So can he create on his own like that? I mean, I think that's what you're looking for in a guy that you're taking, you know, potentially in the top of the second, you know, in the middle of the second round, that's especially if you're, if you're trying to consider this guy as like a first round talent who got injured and now is being drafted in the second round because of that injury. Like I would need to see more uh, dominance on his part, more kind of creating on his own, I think he's a fine second or third receiver, but that's not necessarily what you're trying to draft uh, right. in a spot where you're going to get him. I feel like he should be your third receiver, and if he's forced into pl- being the second guy, I think you can live with it, but I think you're wanting more. You're going to want somebody yeah. who's a little bit more dynamic after the catch, maybe a little bit more reliable. I, I, there's going to be people, be people that are higher on John Mechie than I am, and that's fine. Mm-hmm. I, I, just not a guy that I love for Dallas. Uh, I agree. All right, let's, let's get to some more questions. Uh, this next one, Landon. What trade back option is more appealing to you? Kansas City at 29 or Detroit at 32? Now, if you trade it back to 29, you could pick up the you could pick up Kansas City's third round pick, which would be pick 94. If you trade it back from 24 to 32, you should be able to get Detroit's second round pick, which is pick 66. What would you rather do in this scenario? I think, I mean, this is not an option, but I would love to figure out a way to get both of Kansas City's first round picks. I would love to figure out a way to do that. Uh, If I'm given the choice, I probably still pick uh, Kansas City uh, because I think, I think if you trade back too far there and you're not getting something else kind of in that, you know, top of the second range back somewhere. Then you could get, you can you can get yourself in trouble. You could trade back so far that you don't get Green or Zion. You could trade back so far that mm-hmm. all the wide receivers are gone too. And then you could get to like you know if you got to thirty two, what would happen if you picked if Zion Zion and Green are gone, all the wide receivers are gone. Where are you going at that point? That's a dangerous spot. I, I think. 29 is probably as comfortable as I feel like I, I could go. And then I, I think the leave. reason is because of Cincinnati at 31, right? Because you yeah. feel like Cincinnati's probably going to take an offensive lineman, whether that's Linderbaum or whether it's Kenyon Green, Zion. There's there's just a good chance that all those guys are gone by 30, 32, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and I and I think that you know the other thing to consider too is that uh you you're probably the last guy that you or they let's say they, cause I yeah. don't feel like you specifically would feel comfortable with this. Probably the last guy of those offensive linemen that you would feel comfortable taking right around there that could come in and give you something would be Tyler Smith. And, sure. and if, and, and if the rumors are true, even he could potentially be gone by the time the Cowboys pick. Yeah. So I just think the Cowboys have to be real careful in their trade back scenario, which is probably why they're going to hold. If they do have a trade back scenario on the table, they may hold on to it all the way up until the time they pick just to kind of confirm that the board falls the way that they want it to uh, before pulling the trigger. Yeah, I agree. I also think if you do that trade with Kansas city and you just move back five spots and you pick up that extra third round pick, you could theoretically package your third round pick yep. in Kansas City's third round pick, and that would get you to the bottom of the second round. So let's say you drafted Kenyon Green at 29, and at 56 was, I don't know, pick, Pickens. Pick, Pickens. And then all of a sudden you've got pick 59, and now you can go get, you know, maybe there's maybe Perion Winfrey is there, or maybe DeMarvin Leal is there, or maybe somebody like Chad Muma, the linebacker mm-hmm. from Wyoming, is there. You get three guys that can come in and start and play right away. I think that's really appealing. I agree. 
Yeah, I think there's there's there is a lot of value or, or a lot of uh, benefit to trading back and getting one of those extra third or second round picks. I, I mean, I think the Cowboys should definitely be on the phone seeing if that's a possibility yeah. uh, right now. I agree. Uh, it seems like the teams at the bottom end of the first round want to start to move up a little bit. Uh, we heard some most of about Green Bay. Kansas City yeah. seems like they're going to be aggressive. Even Detroit. Detroit might be trying to come up and get a quarterback. So I uh, would not be surprised if the Cowboys have multiple trade back options there at 24. All right, let's take one more break so we can tell you guys about Brock Auto. With the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's now impossible for your local chain auto parts store to stock up on all of the parts that you need. Rock Auto has everything from engine control modules and brake parts, motor oil, and even new carpet. Whether it's for your classic or your daily driver, get everything you need in a few easy clicks delivered directly to your door. Best of all, prices at rockauto.com are always reliably low. So go to rockauto.com right now and see all the parts available for your car or truck. Right, locked on in the how did you hear about us box so they know that we sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need. Visit rockauto.com today. All right, Lynn, a couple more questions. Uh, who are your favorite sleepers in this class? Guys that you can get on day three, maybe even UDFA. Do you have anybody that you really like on day three? <sighs> Let's see. I mean, Dave, I mean, the problem is that I don't have like a kind of <laughs> sense on exactly where some of these guys will fall, right? Um, I like uh, I like that kid from the, the kid from Nebraska that we talked about, the linebacker Jojo Doman. Yep, um, I, a, I, I, a nickel linebacker kind of player. Yep, I watched. I got a chance to watch Cam Jurgen. Uh, the Jurgens. Yep, is that is that what his nickname? Oh, that's right. He's the guy that has the beef jerky company, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, beef Jurgens. Uh, yep. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I watched him. I actually liked uh, liked his tape a little bit. Uh, I, I he's kind of a day three guy, right? Yeah. I, um, well, <laughs> depends on who you ask. Currently yeah. on the consensus sport, he's like one twenty one, but I think Dane put him inside his top fifty, which is kind of crazy. Wow. But okay, uh, I I got a guy for you. I don't know if you watched yeah. him yet, but this guy was actually at the Senior Bowl. His name is Matt. Well, let's go. He's an offensive tackle from North from Dakota. Uh, North, North Dakota, Dakota State. Yeah, yeah, North Dakota. Um, yeah, I I did watch him. Four-year starter at left tackle in his four years at North Dakota. Never gave up a sack, right? Now, I know the competition is not great. I'm going to give you the, the, the athletic testing numbers from the combine. You ready? Yeah. 6075, 312 pounds, 36 and an eighth inch arms, 86-inch wingspan, 503 40-yard dash, 30-inch vertical, 7263 cone. This guy is an athlete. Yeah. I mean, now – he needs to get a lot stronger, and he's just not a very polished player. But you watch him at the Senior Bowl, and he didn't lose very many reps. And you watched him and Trevor Penning go back to back. There wasn't a ton of difference. So if this is somebody like a very similar to a Terrence Steele situation, where you get him into an NFL weight program, and all of a sudden he can strengthen his core a little bit, and he's got fantastic feet and great length. Why not? I got another one for you. I had I had a little I had a little birdie in my ear the other day. Told yep. me that that potentially the Cowboys could be interested in this guy, which we'll see. So if, if you did, I'll I'll reveal my source on the other side of the draft because uh, it's it's a nice little scoop. But uh, Jason Poe from mm. Mercer, have you heard mm -hmm. of this kid? Mm -hmm. Um, so apparently he worked out at the Georgia uh, uh, Pro Day and just tore totally tore the the place up. If you go and look at Dane's guide. Uh, you know, he this is a guy who started his career at Lenore Rhine, which I'm pretty sure is the is the proverbial uh, uh, bounce house school. If yeah, I'm it's not where mistaken. Kyle uh, Tucker got drafted a couple years ago. Yeah, right? So, uh, yeah. So I, I, he started out there and then transferred to Mercer uh, is an incredible athlete. He's like a little uh, uh, bowling ball. He's like six foot, 300 pounds. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and apparently, uh, uh, just absolutely blew away the testing at the Georgia pro day, like was just absolutely freakish there. Um, and there's been talk about him playing guard, but the interesting thing about him, Marcus, is that he played fullback and running back in college. Mm. So he at 270 pounds, uh, in high school, I'm sorry, not, not in college. Uh, so 
he's used to being nimble and moving around like that. <laughs> we happen to have an offensive coordinator. I don't know if you've heard who happens to like using offensive linemen as fullback. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would not be surprised if uh, Jason Poe, despite the fact that, you know, look, would I ever imagine the Cowboys drafting someone who went to Mercer? Probably not. But I mean, the times are changing. Maybe, maybe this is a new day for Will McClay. And, and, and now he's looking for his 300 pound fullbacks at Mercer. Uh, so I like we'll it. Uh, I'll give you another one because uh, this, this is a lot of fun. Um, and this guy, I don't know if you can call him a sleeper necessarily, but Kennedy Brooks, a running back from Oklahoma. Mm. Uh, now he has some off the field stuff uh, that has to, you get to look into a little bit, but three years, he, all three years that he was there, uh, he was a thousand yard rusher. He was so good that it made Trey Sermon have to transfer to Ohio state. And then Sermon ended up becoming an early third round pick by the 49ers and uh, wow. When he was there, uh, pretty clearly better than a lot of the other running backs like Ramondre Stevenson, Trey Sermon, Rodney Anderson, who got drafted yep. by the Bengals a couple years ago, Eric Gray. Uh, not super athletic, but somebody that just knows how to read blocks, really tough inside runner. He's probably going to be a seventh round pick or undrafted free agent, but would not shock me at all if he's the next like James Robinson in the NFL. Yeah. You know, it's funny because like these guys, like they suddenly the, the news gets out and their stocks are flying up, up high. It's it's kind of like Jelani Woods. I mean, Jelani mm -hmm. Woods would have been my th day three uh, sleeper, you know, a couple of weeks ago. But that's certainly his that ship has sailed now. He's flying up draft boards. So, uh, yeah, I think that those are those are all those guys are, are interesting guys. It, it, do, it There does seem to be a lot of interesting kind of developmental offensive linemen down down the draft i mean there's the kid from uh wake forest uh, there's you know there's a, there's a couple other kids that are just like interesting yeah. developmental prospects uh that you, you think have tools that you could get them into a, a weight program and then see if they can fill up uh all right last question before we head out uh this is a this is a good one from poncho he wants to know how would you feel if we gave up this year's picks for next year's picks and he suggested like what about trading your third rounder this year, your third and fifth this year for a second round pick next year? Would you be interested in doing things like that? So what, what, give me the proposal so like again. Tra trading like 88 and 167 for, let's say, Kansas City's second round pick next year. <sighs> yeah, I mean – I think, you know, there is value in definitely trying to get, you know, more picks for next year. Um, I, I think the cow, I think it depends on what the Cowboys do the first two days, right? Like if they get what they need out of 56 and I'm sorry, out of uh, 24 and 56, uh, I wouldn't be, be opposed to that, right? Like kind of trading for future picks. Uh, but I think it's, it's key that you need to kind of secure a certain amount of what you need up front before you kind of feel comfortable doing that. Right. Like I, I don't know that if you missed on your wide receiver or your offensive lineman, in the first two rounds that you're going to be like super willing to give away yeah. a, a, your another yeah. shot at kind of getting one of those guys. Now here's where I think teams should be smart in doing it. And we see this happen every year is you'll see somebody that let's, let's use the Raiders. For example, they don't pick until 86, right? They are going for it this year. Could they say, hey, we'll give you pick 86 this year and our second round pick next year for 56? You're not really losing a pick. You're just sliding down 30 or so picks and you're picking up an extra top 64 pick next year. That's th that's appealing to me if you could do stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, again, like that's a dangerous spot. Like it so is you definitely, you definitely would have to be, you know, you definitely have your, have your hands around the idea of like what you're risking by moving out of 56, even further back. Like there's, there's some opportunity that you're going to lose there, but you know, that second round pick next year may make that worth the cost, right? If you'd it, like it, some of the guys in those third round, then maybe this is a, a, a very palatable. It, trade. And, listen, I, I think the Raiders are going to be good this year, but you just never know. They're in a really tough conference. Again, this is just an example, but would yeah, it shock yeah. you if the Raiders finish 7-10 and 10 and all of a sudden that pick is now 48, right? And you just basically stole pick 48, a, a top 50 set pick for next year that you could move up and go get an elite player. Those are the kind of trades I'd like to see the Cowboys make where you're not really losing a pick, you're just sliding down a little bit. 
I also think it depends again, kind of going back to what what's the the tone of the Cowboys offseason. Are they going for it this year? Or are they still kind of trying to build continuously for next year? If, that, if that's the case, then then yeah, this trade makes a ton of sense. But if you're trying to kind of you know sort of go all in, which I it, it clearly doesn't feel like that that's the case. It feels like they're pushing more towards 2023. Then then that makes a lot of sense to do this trade. Well, you know, and I, I think it makes a lot of sense, especially like if they really like Sam Williams and it's like, you know what, this is probably too high to pick Sam Williams, but we don't want to, we don't want to wait until 88. Let's pick up another third round pick and we'll maybe trade up from 86 to 75 and get him there. Like yeah. that's where it's appealing. Absolutely. So, and, and, we'll and, and I think you get, and you get the benefit of picking up that extra pick. It, it does make sense. I think the Cowboys are going to move around. We did see them trade back once last year. Uh, they only moved down two spots, picked up a third round pick. Wouldn't be surprised if they did something very similar again like that this year, because I don't know if there's a big gap between pick 24 and 29. There might be a, there might be a big gap between 24 and 32. We'll see, but expect the Cowboys to do a lot of moving and shaking in this year's draft. All right. That is it for today's show. Thank you guys for tuning in. I think we set a record for the most questions answered. On the Lockdown Cowboys podcast. We're getting there. We're, we're, we're increasing every week. four. No, I That's think right. we got yeah. to four now. But, uh, follow the show wherever you get your podcast. You can check us out on YouTube. You guys have been doing great subscribing over there. We're trying to get to 5,000 subscribers before please, the guys. draft. Please, please, please help us out. Uh, follow Landon at McCoolBCB. I'm at Marcus underscore Mosier. We'll see you guys next time.